Well, the only reason I'm here is because Mike has twisted my arm. He's a smooth talker. I've been enjoying retirement for the last 20 years, and I just let, have been enjoying the nice, easy life. But anyway, he couldn't let me do that. So anyway, uh, I, and I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, 16 years old. I was, had dropped out of high school. My mother had a lot of kids I hated at the, at the house. I hated everything about life in those days. So I decided that at 16, I said, well, I, I, my uh, brother was in the Air Force. So I said, I, I've got to join the military, but I'm not going to join the Air Force. So I decided to join the Navy. And, um, and so I signed up, but unfortunately I was only 16. I had to wait till I was 17. So in uh, March of 1960, they loaded me on a bus, took me to boot camp. And, um, and, it, and it, they were desperate for, for recruits in those days. That's one of the reasons they accepted me. But, but anyway, in boot camp, um, I, I, I really thrived because uh, I, was, I was getting into trouble. I was not, uh, wasn't going to school. And um, so the three meals a day, the exercise, the, the badly needed discipline uh, was, was very good for me. So uh, the, I, I, was a, I was a squad leader. That's me in the back, up in the corner up there. At 17 years old, anyway, the, uh, the, I, I, did, uh, I did what I was supposed to do. Uh, there was another um, opportunity I had. I was the, the, the coxswain on the whaleboat races, and, and we uh, won the whale, whaleboat race. Um, while I was in, in uh, boot camp, that's where you, you kind of uh, are tested and applied for where you'd like to to end up, and I, since I lived in the desert, I was kind of intrigued by the Navy, so, um, and so I applied for submarines, and uh, was very fortunate they accepted me in the submarine service, and uh, so after boot camp, I went to uh, submarine school there in San Diego for another five months, and, um, and then after the submarine sonar school, uh, so went to transferred me to to New London, Connecticut, for the submarine training school. Uh, submarine training school, and was um, that's the only picture I have of that was graduation day. But um, was very intense. Besides learning the all of the aspects of a submarine and and the, 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 how they operate and so on and so forth, some of the training was. Uh, was physically challenging. For example, uh, each submarine has an, an escape hatch, and the escape hatch is in the forward torpedo room. So they have a, a tank that simulates that, um, that, that escape tank. So they load about eight guys in this very small container and, um, and, and then flood it. And then no mass or anything else, just they just flood the tank. So then they'd open up the hatch on the side and you were, your lungs were full of compressed air. So then as you went to the surface, you, you, what, it was about 100 foot, so you had to, to uh, blow out the air, otherwise your lungs would, would uh, blow up. So on the way up, there's all these divers in there and if you, if you weren't blowing air constantly on your way to the surface, they'd punch you in the stomach. So. I got three or four punches, but nice. probably, probably saved my life. But, but anyway, there's a, and another, another training that I remember where you, uh, they put a, a, probably about 20 guys in a, in a tube, a round tank, and then they, they fill it full, they pressurize the air, and then they take, you deep, deep pressurize, and just back and forth testing you to see if you can, uh, how you're going to respond to that. Um, the, to the pressure changes, so there were a number of guys that had broken eardrums, and and there were a, a number of guys that asked to quit because they're claustrophobic. But I was 17; I, nothing bothered me that I was invincible. But so so after submarine school, my first assignment was in Key West, Florida, and that oh, oh this was. Uh, 
one of the few times that I remember we had a good time when I was in summer school, but this was New Year's Eve, and I had just turned 18, so we went to, to Times Square, did a little celebrating. We could drink beer then, so. So anyway, my first assignment was on a, um, an old uh, uh, World War II. This was a veteran boat. It was a, a decorated uh, boat. And um, one, of the, one of the responsibilities you have when you go on a submarine is um, you have to qualify. Now qualifying means that you, you have to learn every aspect of the boat. You have to learn every one of the positions. Um, so you have, it takes about six months, you have to diagram each electrical, each hydraulic, each system. And then within that department, you would have to um, uh, go, to, go to the chief or who, the, the person in charge of that department and prove to them that you could do, actually perform the function. So I'll just give you an idea of what some of this, like for example, here's the forward torpedo room. Um, so you had to learn how to, to set up the torpedoes, how to fire them. Um, the, uh, you could see <laughs> there's a torpedo missing here, but the bunks, see how the bunks slide out? So you, they slide out, so you, you basically live uh, sleep in the amongst the torpedoes. I think this I think when I was in there the sonar room was in the forward torpedo room So right back over here to the left was the torpedo. Room. I think one of those bunks right over there was mine But I was 17 and skinny and didn't bother me, but So uh, for example, here's a, uh, a set of valves that are used when you when you dive the, and they give the command to dive, the, the, the guy that's, that's manning the, the, the dive function has to open valves, allow water to come in, water, uh, air to escape, and, and balance it so that the, the boat achieves neutral buoyancy. It's pretty tricky. I couldn't do it today, but in those days, for quite part of qualifying, I could perform that function. Um, this was just a picture we took, I took out of the periscope. It was one of the functions I had to learn how to do was use the periscope and, and the camera associated with it and that sort of thing. So I think that was a destroyer. Anybody know? Destroyer. That's yeah. Destroyer. Those are the guys that used to drop depth charges on us. Also known as a target. Target. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so here's, here's the, uh, one of the, of course you have to, uh, cook and clean up and all that stuff during while you were in that um, in that uh, qualifying phase. So that's some of my friends getting breakfast ready. We had to learn how to and actually how to physically how to l load torpedoes. Now torpedoes uh, and and even though in those days the nuclear boats were were pretty much had taken over. So with these, our boats were used only for training. The old diesels, we'd go out and, and operate and they would use us for target practice. So, but we actually carried live torpedoes. It was Cold War, we were nervous, so we, we always carried live torpedoes. This was in, this was in 61. So there I am on the operating the sonar, just a dinky little uh, corner room in the uh, in the forward torpedo room. Uh, that was my that was my special. That's what I've been trained for. So after I qualified on the on the um, the spike fish, it was it was this was. Um, Oh, 1962, when I, they transferred me to another boat, the, the, the Quillback. The first boat, the Spikefish, didn't even have a snorkel. This one at least had a snorkel. And it was also a, a World War II boat. But um, the, um, So anyway, in, in 62, when they sent me to um, the, uh, to the Quillback, I had gone through some training in, there in Key West to learn the newer sonar. So then they transferred me to this boat, 
where I had the newer uh, updated sonar. Um, and and at, at that time, they, were, they knew that they were going to decommission the spike fish and take it out and use it for target practice, which they did the next year. The Cuban Missile Crisis kind of slowed that process down for, for decommissioning boats. But, but um, so anyway, a typical, a typical uh, day, this was periodically, maybe once a month, we'd have to dress up on our, put on our dress whites and, uh, and do a, 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 an inspection for the local uh, commander. So I'm back here in, in the back somewhere. So hiding back here. But anyway, um, so what they would do, we would, as I say, we would operate out either off of Key West or they would send us down to Guantanamo Bay and we would go down there for six weeks and we would, during the day, we would go out and, and uh, submerge and the, and the aircraft would search for us and the destroyers would do, drop depth charges on us. Um, I had I was a sonar man. It was a passive sonar, so you just so you just listen, and uh, those guys would drop these depth charges, and supposedly they would just put a little bit of dynamite in those, in those. Things. But they used the real full size depth charge. But but to a sonar man hearing that stuff, it was like the real full thing. So anyway, it was kind of I think my ears. Are, you see, I have hearing aids on. So I think probably wiped me out, but but. Um, Anyway, the, we'd go down to Guantanamo Bay and stay for six weeks, and there really wasn't much to do. You, there, you could go into the base and, and, and buy a bunch of beer and come back. But so what they would do is they'd pull a barge up and park it on the other side of the, the uh, pier, and then we'd use it for, uh, uh, they'd get, put a bunch of cots in there, because it, was, it wasn't that, as you saw in the tor forward torpedo room, sleeping in those bunks was not that great. And there were not enough bunks for all of the sailors anyway, so we did what we used to call hot bunking. So whoever was on duty, uh, you know, uh, the guys that were off duty slept in those bunks that were available, whatever was available. So anyway, this is what, this is what we did. We drank beer and smoked cigarettes and played poker. And, um, and on inside, one time on inside the barge, we had taken all of our beer cans and lined them up on the walls. We had two full walls covered with beer cans. But, but, uh, but on weekends, um, <coughs> I think I went down there and on, between the two boats maybe half a dozen times, six weeks each time. And all together, probably about 10 trips to Jamaica. What we would do is on Friday night after maneuvers, we'd head for a various port in Jamaica. And, uh, and then on Sunday night, we'd leave Jamaica, come back and, and operate with the, uh, with the, with the various uh, uh, carriers and destroyers and so on and so forth. So on one, we were in Ocho Rios in October of uh, 62, and we came back to, uh, to operate, so it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, we were ready to move, and they sent us into, into, to, uh, to the base. So when we got into, into Guantanamo Bay, the, the, the base was pretty well deserted. There was only one ship left, and they were loading civilians, and um, we had no clue what was going on. And I don't think that even the captain knew what was going on. But, but um, so anyway, they sent us into port and, and asked us to, to bring up, because we had machine guns and rifles, so we had to triple the, the, our guard and anyway. So um, later on that day, the captain had, had heard from, uh, from Washington that they had, the United States had put up the roadblock. And so they, they definitely didn't want us out there in the, in the middle of all of that because, you know, we, we would have been a great target and they couldn't guarantee our safety. So, so for the next 10 days, we stayed there in port and drank a lot of beer and, and played poker. And um, anyway, that's just the, the night. So we we didn't really understand what was going on. 
But then when Kennedy came on and, and gave his, his speech and told us what was happening, apparently the Russians had, well, Castro had taken power. And of course, when, when we supported Castro overturning Batista, but then uh, not too long after Castro took power, he uh, went, uh, basically went to bed with, with Khrushchev. Khrushchev promised to, because Castro obviously was a social, socialist minded guy. So anyway, Castro promised him the world. So he became a big Castro fan. So what? Uh, we had, um, because of the Bay of Pigs, the year before, six, seven, 61, I think, was the Bay of Pigs, we had uh, agreed to support uh, a, uh, a group of, of Cuban exiles to overthrow Castro. So, but at the last minute, and, and Kennedy had just taken office at that time, so at the last minute, we, we were supposed to supply air support. For, for this invasion, this, this uh, um, rebellion against Castro. So at the last minute, Kennedy said, it's not a good idea. We start, we start bombing Castro, Khrushchev's friends, it's World War III. So he walked away from it and he took a lot of guff for it, but kept us from going into World War III. Um, so anyway, we, we stayed there for the 10 days and then when things cooled down a little bit, we went back to Key West around the western side of, of Cuba. And when we got to Key West, that's, that's kind of when we realized that um, we, were, we were so close to World War III, it was amazing. The, um, there was a three-mile beach. We used to go and, and hang out and drink beer. It was all barbed wire off, and as far as you could see were these missiles aimed at, at Cuba. All of the hotels were taken over by the Army. The Army had the missiles in those days. And, um, and that's, when we, that's when the reality hit that we were that close. Um, we found out later that there were a number of... Uh, Khrushchev and, and Kennedy, neither one of them really wanted to go to war. But there were a number of people that were very interested in going to, to war. When, when Kennedy was presented, um, the, uh, the, there was a U-2 that went over, flew over and saw the missiles that were being installed in, in Guantanamo Bay, or in, uh, in uh, Havana. Um, they showed that to the Joint Chiefs of Staffs, and the Joint Chiefs uh, went to Kennedy and said, we got we got to bomb them. We have to bomb them, where it's our only choice. Kennedy struggled with that, and he said, no, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna, we're gonna put up a roadblock and, and tell Khrushchev that he needs to remove all those missiles. So, fortunately, he did. The other, the other thing that, was, that, that made us very close is that there was a, um, we found out this out later, there was a, a, a Russian submarine, it's an old diesel boat, but it carried nuclear warheads on its torpedoes, uh, B-59. Anyway, it was out submerged in the middle of that, that roadblock area. And, um, and the guy, they, they had been so, they were so far down in water, they'd lost communication with, with Moscow. So they, but they were absolutely convinced that World War III had already started. So there were three uh, officers on, that, on the boat. One of them was the captain, and then there was a, the, the, um, the other guy was the flotilla commander. commander. And then the third one, of course, was the, the communist uh, political officer, they called him. In order to fire the, the nuclear torpedoes, they had to have an agreement with all three of them. Two of them were ready to push the button. One of them was the flotilla commander. He just, he absolutely, they, they argued all day long, and they finally, uh, the, the, since they didn't have it, they were ready to fire the nuclear, that would have started World War III. So anyway, the, uh, the, at, in, in the meantime, we knew they were down there, so we were dropping these, these small um, charges, basically to send them a message to surface. And so eventually they did, they surfaced, 
and then we let them go and sent them back to, to Moscow. That was incredibly close. If that uh, third guy had said it, they'd have sent nuclear torpedoes and we'd have been in war. <clears throat> so, and the third one, oh, Castro. Castro himself was a, was a warmonger. He was absolutely convinced, be, partly because of the Bay of Pigs, he was convinced that the United States was going to attack Cuba. So he, he, and his goal at that point was to become a martyr. So he tried um, to convince the Russians that they should fire the, start firing the missiles at the United States and at least do some serious damage before they were, before they were totally destroyed. He spent, uh, they had, and um, uh, underneath the uh, Russian embassy, they had a, a, a cellar, a kind of a, a bomb shelter. And he spent the whole day in there with the ambassador writing drafts of, of what he wanted Khrushchev to do and finally sent it off to Khrushchev. Khrushchev said, the guy is a maniac. He says, he's, uh, he says, he's crazy. We're not going to do this. So anyway, fortunately, the guy did not, they didn't have the, all of the, the missiles fully capable at that point. Otherwise, Khrushchev probably would have, I mean, uh, Castro probably would have got one of his guys to start pushing the buttons and, and we would have been in serious trouble. But So that, that, we came so close to World War III by a number of situations. But fortunately, uh, Khrushchev realized that um, he really didn't want to go to war. He wanted to have, he was using the, the missiles in Cuba as a way of leveraging. And I think in those days, they, we had some pretty long range missiles. They only had intermediate range missiles. So the closer he could get to the United States, the better uh, uh, position he was in in case there was a, a war. And then people thought in those days, I don't know if some of you, us older guys remember, they used to, used to have the, the bunkers and, and practice in schools. We practiced the, the drills. and We were all convinced that the war was coming. So, oh, so I wanted to, to mention when we, when we were in Guantanamo Bay, um, the uh, one, of, one of the days, that, during that 10 days, we had to go in and, and stock up on our beer. So, um, so and there were several of us went in and, and um, there was, we met, it, there was a constant flow of planes coming in to Guantanamo Bay, constant. And they were bringing in Marines to, 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 to support the, the perimeter of the base. And, and of course, as a, as a young uh, sailor, the Marines were always the gate guards. And they were always, in my opinion, no Marines here. In my opinion, they were the wimpy Marines. But these guys that were coming into Guantanamo Bay to guard that, the, the perimeter of the base, these were the real Marines. These were tough guys. Some of those guys had equipment and and weapons that I didn't even know existed in those days. But, but, uh, but that, but any attack on the base, of course, I don't know what they'd have done if they fired the missiles from, from Key West, or, you know, they would have, the Marines would have gone down with the rest of them. But anyway, that was a pretty impressive sight to see all those, those Marines um, ready for action. Um, so, any questions on the Cuban Missile Crisis? The, um, since we've got a little time, I'll give you a few sea stories. What year was that? We used to, pardon? What year was that? That was October of 62. And the, the whole crisis lasted uh, uh, two weeks, 13 or 14 days. From the time Kennedy put up the roadblock to the time the Khrushchev Agreed and signed, and but it took it took months and months before those those missiles that were on the beach in Key West were there uh, 
well into the next year. They weren't in any hurry in case Khrushchev changed his mind. But. So anyway, there was one, one time, and I don't remember exactly which boat it was on, but I just remember it was a heck of an experience. There was a hurricane coming through, um, through Key West, and, uh, and so in those, you know, it, 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 the boats, in, during a hurricane, they send all the boats and ships out to sea to ride it out. You can't leave them there at the pier because it will destroy the boat and the pier. So, so anyway, they sent us out to ride out this hurricane, and it was just miserable. The boat, the boat's a little over 300 foot long, and, uh, and those swells, would we, we would basically disappear in the water. And so, so we were out there for a couple of days. And, um, and we thought we pretty much were, were in the clear because all of a sudden it got real calm. And, <laughs> and we thought, oh man, we've got to make it. So, so anyway, the captain came on the loudspeaker and says, you know, batten down the hatches because we're in deep pucky because we were in the eye of that thing. <laughs> and, and, I, and I tell you, when, that, when we came through that eye and we were just, there wasn't a there wasn't a guy on that ship that wasn't, oh, that was putrid, this, this, the vomit, and the, we all smoked cigarettes in those days, and oh, it was, and then the diesel fumes on top of that, and the, just your stomach's going on, oh, it was a mess. But, but you wouldn't have submerged during part of that storm? The, the problem, they wouldn't let us submerge because see those old diesel boats, you can't stay long, the longest I was ever submerged was eight hours. The, you can't, it, there's a point, where you, you're submerging or, or coming up where you have to achieve neutral buoyancy. Mm -hmm. And at that point, if you had, if the slightest wave hit you, you know, you capsize and it's all over. So, oh. and, you, and you could only, like I say, for eight hours, but you'd have to surface, so. We were out there for about three days. <laughs> so it was, it was miserable. Um, did you comment earlier, Bill, on what was the standard day, 24-hour day for you when you were out? Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't, but I, but I will. We, yeah. and see, in those old boats, as I say, there weren't enough bunks for everybody. So uh, we did a, we mustered at 8 o'clock in Key West or in Guantanamo Bay, wherever we were. We muster at 8, go out to sea, maneuver, submerge, um, and, and let them hunt for us and drop depth charges. We were usually in by five o'clock. They gave us a, a barracks. We'd walk to the barracks and, and spend our time there. And it was also a, a restaurant on base that we could use if we wanted to. But if you but, were on a multi-day patrol, I mean, you obviously were out a couple days just getting from the U.S. to go to right. So what would go on in a 24-hour cycle um, like that? Y well, you would. You wouldn't think about showering because the showers were filled with potatoes and bulk food, canned goods, things like that. So, um, so you would you just rotate on your watch. When I like a sonar, for example, when we were on the surface, I ran the radar and did the, the uh, uh, tracking, plotting for when we found other ships to keep us off uh, off the. Uh, Collision courses. So it, so so you serve uh, like a four-hour watch, and then you'd have a little off time. You could go down and and uh, and uh, no beer on in those days. So on the boat. So so anyway, you would uh, bas basically hang out or sleep, and then just rotate every four hours. Where would you eat your meals? There must have been a little galley city. Yeah, that's something. what you what you saw in that one photo was it. That was the that was where we ate. That was where everything, oh, okay. but we had to eat in shifts. The officers had their own quarters. In fact, I'll show you to you in, in just a minute. But there were, you could probably put uh, six guys at each one of these little tables, and I think there were six tables, so, so you feed half at a time. How was the food? Did Excellent. Good mess? Excellent. One of the, one of the things about uh, submarine service was that when we went into base, we could get pretty much our first choice of, of uh, the, the most recent released movies. So we had those, one of those old, old uh, 
big real Indian projectors. And we could and we could pretty much pick our, our food too. So for example, we could we ate steak a lot, we ate I mean, we ate really well. There were a number of times, in fact I'll show you a picture here, where um, we came back well, I'll tell you the story in a minute. Um, we came back from we were in town having a good time and came back and this this is a friend of mine. He was cooking us he was fixing up some steak and and uh, uh, potatoes for us, so we 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 pretty much had free run of the galley as long as we cleaned up our mess. But anyway, this is that that's where you did the cooking. It was it was pretty tight quarters. Um, this is the captain's <coughs> or, or the uh, officers' quarters, and there were usually about twelve, about a dozen guys. So there were there were a couple of tables. So this is one of our folk again. Fortunately. This the one of the officers was a poker player, so we could we could play poker first class. In those days, uh, you got paid once a month, so we had um, what we called payday stakes. So we'd have a guy, and I was most of the time I was the the guy that kept track of the books and uh, just kept track of how much come payday, how much each guy owed. There were times when I signed over my whole paycheck and couldn't go. Couldn't go ashore for for another month, but there were other times when I'd win enough money and we'd a couple of us would go up to West Palm Beach and rent a car and have a great time. But but anyway, um, this guy <coughs> sailors love to to prank each other. This is a new guy that just came on boat on the boat boat and what he's doing is looking for a mail buoy. <laughs> <laughs> so he, so he's, you see, he's got the 45 on his hip, and he's got there's a grappling hook there, and he's got the rope, so he finds it. <laughs> anyway, they did that to me when I first went on, but you know, it didn't take long to figure it out, and that there were no pictures. So this is this is one of the newbies that I took a picture. Of. <laughs> Is that a lifeline or whatever he's wearing around the white belt around his waist? Um, whenever you're in, in, in port, um, you have a um, you have a, a, a watch, 24-hour watch on on board, and then down below, and he and you always stare at that that belt with the 45. So the officers were in on this. That's why we we allow that. So. Um, <laughs> Let me just make sure I've covered everything. Did I go through all of the photos? Well, one question. Yeah. The quill back doesn't look like a World War II era sub. And there was what a guppy to conversion or something. It was. Well, it, yes, it was. It was converted. It was converted um, not too long after the war. Both the spike fish and the quill back were built in 1944. Yeah. So, but the the, uh, the spike fish early enough in the year. That they actually went on several patrols and sank some, but in but the Quebec uh, went on patrol but never sank any any ships. <coughs> yeah, I think I pretty well covered everything. So um, so after I got out of the navy, I kept my promise to my mother and uh, finished my education. I got a GED while I was in the navy. And then I, I got, when I got out of, the, out of the Navy, I got married, had a couple of kids, decided I needed to go back to school. So, um, so, I, so I went, of course it was a little struggle because I didn't know, I, had, I, 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 I quit high school in the 10th grade twice, in the, in the first, before Christmas. So anyway, I had to learn how to learn, and then I, and in those days I was a good Mormon boy, and, and uh, and I didn't drink, and the bishop recommended me for uh, BYU, so I went to BYU and graduated there in 71. And, and then I had a very successful career in the corporate environment. I was a corporate accountant, and uh, I did pretty well. And I was living in San Jose. I, I started selling real estate and, and uh, made very good money. And I retired and sold my real estate business when I was 56. I've just been playing for the last 20 years. I have a 
travel a lot and have a motor home and just enjoy life until Mike got a hold in for this. Dang <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>, you, Mike. <laughs> uh, could you put the patch up one more time if you'd be so kind? Uh huh. These these patches were yeah. more they're more direct uh, decorative than anything else. They were they served no functional purpose for us. But yeah, and the ironic thing is, in the fifties, sixties, even the seventies, the ships designed their own patches, mm -hmm. and some were very creative, like this one. But then, as the eighties and the nineties rolled around, the navy started to do the patch design, and they all looked alike pretty much, mm -hmm. except the ship's name and hull number. But that's a beautiful patch. With about 12 years ago, someone from one of the boats um, contacted me and um, and come to find out all these years they've been having reunions. In those days, they had the reunions uh, in various places like every five years. So the first one I went to, I think, was in 2006 in uh, Little Rock. And, uh, and then shortly after that, they realized that the guys were falling. We're dying at a pretty fast rate, so they started doing them every two years, and now they're doing them one every every year. So in May, we're we're getting together in uh, Savannah, Georgia. So we always have a good time. But I, I remember the, the first one that I went to in Little Rock. You know, the, the old guys. We sit around. We had a table, big round table, and we would sit around and drink beer. And the first thing you know, the table was full of empty beer bottles and cans. But the last one I went to, which was in Houston, not too long ago, those old guys can't drink. They, I, I was the only one that could drink. I just, I don't know what it is, but I practice a lot, that's the thing. <laughs> yes, sir? Sir, for a while in that period, uh, the, the Navy had some nuclear tip, uh, mainly anti-sub um, torpedoes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ezra? Yeah, did, did they ever issue those on, the, on your little diesel subs, or were those just a big... The, which kind of diesel, which kind of torpedoes? Uh, nuclear tip. No, no, uh, we never, the, none of the diesel boats never had those. No, no they were all conventional. Right. Yeah. Now, the first one that actually launched a nuclear warhead would have been the Adrenal, and she had the Azeroth aboard her. And there's pictures of her on, online where you can see the big mushroom cloud mm -hmm. uh, with her silhouetted within it, you know, so... Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, a side story. Uh, during the uh, missile crisis, uh, we lived in Plattsburgh, New York, from the Lake SAC base. And my wife was teaching at an elementary school out near the air base. And finally, uh, one afternoon, they had to cut every, all the classes off. Said we couldn't hear thunder, couldn't hear each other speak. Something was going on out of the base. Well, they were taken off. And 20, 30 years later, I ran into a guy down in, in Arizona, and I related that to him. He said, yes, I know where they were going. I was in Albuquerque putting nuclear missiles on those SAC planes mm. during that, that period of time. Well, I think Lou Moyer, Lou, you, you flew, flew B-52s and stuff during that period. I flew, I flew five uh, airborne alert missions that month of October, 24 hours each. Ten nukes on board, uh, flew around north of north of the North American continent, so we were reasonably close to the Soviet Union, uh, and then down on the west side, down the oceans. Uh, one other thing I thought I'd mention, which had nothing really to do with anything here, but <clears throat> after they got rid of the diesel subs, GE still had a lot of valves and so from these old subs. And that's what they put in the Atlas missile sites. Mm -hmm. And if you recall oh, reading yeah. stories about Atlas <clears throat> missiles blowing up, it was usually because one of those valves failed. Uh, mm -hmm. But they came out of the, you know, they had been built in the early 40s for the submarines, not, not for Atlas missiles. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, during, the, during that crisis, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, think, I believe Kennedy and Khrushchev both believed that, that we would end up in war. And um, so the, throughout the world, the, the military was activated. You hear stories all the time about, about like for example, in those days, we had, we had missiles in uh, uh, Turkey that we could easily assess 
Russia. And Russia, of course, was very concerned about that. And we were, all we had to do was push the button. So the military was activated everywhere, but we were very fortunate. We came close, but we, we survived. I might add to that comment of yours. That was what we gave Khrushchev right. so that he would save Trade face. Off. We yeah. took the missiles out of Turkey. What we didn't tell Khrushchev, we moved the Polaris submarines into the Mediterranean <laughs> at the same time. The, the summer, the, 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 this new submarine, oh, and this is another story I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> when it, at, at Key West, they were, of course, everything had been converted to, to nuclear, or only a few of the old, the old diesel boats. So they sent the Nautilus uh, down to Key West on a re recruiting mission. So anyway, some of us went over and, and toured the, the boat, and it was really impressive. And um, they had a library, they had a gymnasium, and just every, any kind of food, anything you wanted. And so I asked the guy, I said, uh, I said, when you go out to sea, uh, don't you stay submerged? He said, yeah. I said, how long? And he said, oh, three or four months. I said, adios. <laughs> no way. I could not imagine not seeing the sun for three months. Oh, those guys, I give them a lot of credit for doing that. Well, any other final questions? Well, thank oh. you for your service. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, again a quick reminder, we do have this upcoming workshop, you know, on genealogy. Sign up list is over there. Gary's there, can answer all your questions. Uh, and we are looking for some more people who would be interested in joining us for that.